value of promoting property of the property issue. All this work has been done in collaboration with Gabriel and Carlo Mirlanda. So this is the, the outline of the talk. Uh, I will start by reviewing the different status of high energy uh, detection from the last instrument for Fermin. For high energy, I mean um, radiation above 0.1 GeV up to several tenths of GeV. And I will uh, discuss the evidence that support an external shock origin for the uh, high energy vision. Then I will uh, estimate the bus current factor, for example, of camera burst. Uh, from the measurement of the peak time of the after flow after life and thanks to the estimate of the vascular factor we can study the moving properties of the ground emission and uh, finally I will discuss how this study on the moving properties can help us to uh, better understand the so-called spectral energy correlation which are correlation found between the spectral properties of the front emission and the uh, energetic or luminosity. So let's start with the high energy emission. Uh, this is a typical strong spectrum. So in a neural flow representation, the low energy power index is typically one and the high energy power index is minus 0.3, minus 0.5. And this is more or less the energy rate of sensitivity of the GPM instrument. And uh, the last instrument on board Fermi extends this energy rate. So now we can detect gamma reserves up to uh, 300 GB. Uh, okay, so what we, we expect to see in this uh, energy rate? Of course, for very bright or particularly hard gamma reserves, we do expect to detect the extrapolation of the front emission. Um, however, from egress observation, we already know that in some cases uh, it's possible that there are evidence of a different spectral component. So, um, it is now thanks to us that we can study the spectral and temporal properties of this high energy emission. And the present lab detected 28 events, three short are short words, and for nine there is the estimate of the redshift. And all these high energy emissions share some common properties. For example, the high energy emission uh, always starts during the usual prompt emission for usual prompt emission I mean the emission speed at lower energy in the TV and in the energy range by the GPM. And often it's possible to measure a small delay between the onset of the front emission and the onset of the high energy uh, radiation. And the, the high energy radiation lasts longer as compared to the ground. So in order to convey the origin of this emission, we should uh, um, study the spectral and temporal properties of the radiation detected by us. And to this day, in 2010, we uh, study all the Earth with last detection. At that time, we had 11 Earth detected by last, 9 long and 2 short, and plus 1 Earth seen by Adjutant before the launch of the Earth. Okay, so these are, these are all the high energy last curve of the 11 gamma reserves. Uh, this is the rate above 0.1 GD. And the shaded region show the duration of the emission C at lower energies by the GBM, the, the crop emission. So as you can see, all these last curves show a power of behavior uh, after uh, a peak. Sometimes it's possible to see an initial peak in the last curve. And then the, the last curve decays in time and the power. This is in particular the, the last curve of, of 090510, which is a particularly bright short burst. The right is uh, consistent with this, uh, this square, then there is a peak at 0.3 seconds, and after the peak, the last curve decays, uh, and uh, the decay is right steeper, 1.5. What about the spectra? So, again, this is the typical band spectrum described in the front emission. 
this is number of photons, so this uh, alpha is typically minus 1 and beta minus 2.3, 2 2.4. And uh, we model the last data with single power law, that we call gamma, and we compare the number of uh, gamma with alpha and beta. So, first of all, gamma ranges between minus 1.6 and minus 2.4, so the typical value is minus 2, which means that in a Newton representation, the spectrum is nearly flat. And uh, gamma is also very softer than alpha, but is uh, harder than the Abramsa case in which gamma and beta are consistent, but in most cases, uh, gamma is harder. This means that uh, sometimes the situation in this one, we see the extrapolation of the from spectrum, beta and gamma are consistent, but in most cases, the situation is this one. So we are dealing with two different spectral components. Okay, in this plot, we uh, compare the fluencies uh, detected by the GDM and the fluencies detected by LAP. This is the quality line. So in most cases, the, the LAP fluence is lower than the GDM fluence by factor of five in the case of uh, Just in one case, the two fluences are uh, comparable. And also in the two short curves uh, in our sensor, the, the two fluences are similar. Uh, these are gamma curves with uh, without redshift, and these are curves with redshift. This gray slide shows the one, two, and three sigma of the distribution of all gamma curves uh, detected by the GBM. So it's the GBM fluence distribution uh, of long curves. So as you can see, curves with lab detection tend to be the, um, the brightest in terms of in terms of confirmation. Okay, so to summarize the results for the spectra, we see that often GBM and lab spectra are consistent and this suggests that uh, there are two different spectral components. And so now we have to understand which is the origin of the high energy emissions. And the lab curve of the high energy emissions are smooth, are often thick, and after the peak they all have similar uh, temporal decay and they uh, last uh, uh, longer than the problem. So uh, we um, suggested that the high energy ratio has the same origin as the X-ray and local after. In other words, we uh, also other authors suggested um, the idea that the, the high energy radiation is synchrotron emission uh, from a power shock that develops between the expanding relativistic uh, wave and the external medium. This is called the external shock scenario. Okay, so just um, to consistently check on this uh, model, um, these are the light curves of the four brightest gamma reserves that we redshift detected by LAC. Uh, this is the reference time and uh, all these light curves show an initial peak and uh, the peak time ranges between 0.50 and 3 seconds. So the onset of the afterglow uh, is very early. This is consistent with the afterglow model. In the afterglow model we can estimate the peak of the light curve thanks to the equation. So for typical values of the kinetic energy of the glass curve, and of the density of the interstellar medium, and for quite large bulk Lorentz factor, we estimate the peak time of the order of 0.3 seconds. So perfectly consistent with what we see in the GED emission. Excuse me, is it for a blunt for the solution? Which, uh, which no, I will show after how this equation can be derived. Okay, so um, we can use this equation in another way. If we measure the peak time from our data, we can estimate the bulk Lorentz factor. And for the four brightest camera curves that I mentioned before, we estimate the Lorentz factor between 600 and 1000. Okay, so the second, yeah, the second consistency check is on the temporal decay after the peak. So in the standard adiabatic, model of the thermal uh, afterglow theory. Um, 
the last at k at t to the minus 1. Instead, in the GB last curve, we see a steeper decay. So we propose that the after law that should be radiative, at least in this first 100 seconds. Uh, in the radiative, uh, for radiative after law, the theory predicts that the light curve is uh, proportional to t to the minus 10 over 7, and this rate rise is 10 uh, over 7. Okay, so um, the conclusion of this first part, when the Lorentz factor is large, the afterglow theory predicts a very early onset of the, uh, the emission, and also this emission is very bright, and uh, the Fermilat can detect this emission. The temporal decay suggests that the, the afterglow is radiative, and the, uh, the energy, the total energy emitted during the, the afterglow uh, should be revised because we have to add the um, uh, radiation emitted during, in, in the JEV energy range if we believe to this interpretation. However, uh, we compare the fluences detected by LAT and by the GBM and show that uh, the LAT see a fraction of the fluence detected in, in, during the prompt emission, so uh, this doesn't help to solve the so-called efficiency problem, uh, which means that the energetics of the afterglow is lower than the energetics emitted during the prompt. Um, so now the next step is uh, to test uh, this model, this interpretation, in a more quantitative way. So we have to model the GV data and possibly also X-ray and optical data um, under a very consistent picture based on external shocks. Okay, this is just to show the, the physics of external shocks. We have a ultra-relativistic blast wave expanding into the external medium, and a forward shock shocks develop and swept up matter and hits this matter, and the uh, electrons gain internal energy and uh, they can radiate via synchrotron process at less part of the um, internal energy. So if these um, emissions, is, is, if radiative losses are a small fraction of the dissipated energy, the evolution of the blast wave can be considered adiabatic. Uh, in the other case, if uh, the radiative losses are not negligible, then we talk about a radiative uh, afterglow. Okay, so to our aim, we need a model to uh, describe the dynamics of external shock and then to uh, describe the uh, radiative processes, synchrotron and synchrotron self-compt. Uh, self and of course, in literature, there are a lot of uh, models to describe the dynamics of the external shock. Some, some model is very uh, simple and based on analytical solution. Other models are more sophisticated based on numerical simulation. So we just need a simple but detailed and reasonable model to describe the evolution of the bulk Lorentz factor with the radius during the external shocks. So these are the ingredients of our model. We consider this parameter epsilon, which is the fraction of the dissipated energy which is radiated by the electrons. And of course, we, when epsilon is small, we are able to reproduce adiabatic solutions. When epsilon is one or um, larger than 0.1, um, we can um, reproduce fully radiative or all the intermediate uh, regimes. And we consider adiabatic losses in our model. Um, this allows to reconvert part of the internal energy uh, gained by the shock um, electrons and matter, um, reconvert into bulk uh, motion of, of the fireball. So this is important because allow to consider also um, complex density profile and eventually to uh, describe a reacceleration 
of the fireball. And uh, we um, pay particular attention to the transition from the relativistic to the non-relativistic phase. Uh, for example, if we have initial uh, radiative phase of the blast wave evolution, this uh, transition should happen early. Um, then we are able to reproduce the blend for a key solution during the uh, relativistic deceleration and the set of Taylor solution during the non-relativistic phase. Okay, this is a work in progress, so I will show just this preliminary um, plot. There is uh, the light curve. Uh, this is a light curve describing a fully radiative solution. Epsilon is constant and is one. In this case, instead, epsilon is constant and is 10 to the minus two. So this can be considered an adiabatic solution. And in this case, instead, uh, epsilon evolve over the time in this way. So start in, at the beginning, it's 0.5 and then decrease to 10 to the minus two. So we obtain this light curve. So after the peak... Just efficiency? Sorry? Is the, no, it's the total efficiency. So it's the fraction of energy, of dissipated energy that you give to the electrons and the fraction uh, of uh, this energy that the electron actually radiates because if you are in fast cooling, you can radiate all the energy gained by the electron. Okay. So after the peak, the light is very steep. And then after, in this case, 100 seconds, uh, the light curve is flatter, is minus one. Uh, the decay is the same as during the, as uh, the, the decay show about the adiabatic solution. So uh, I choose 100 because uh, typically we have X-ray and optical data after this time, and uh, we don't need usually of radiative solution um, after uh, in, to explain the X-ray and optical data, and we, we have steep GV light curve uh, in, in this uh, region. So we see the peak, and uh, um, we have in detection of high energy emission up to 100 seconds. Oh, for the X-ray and optical, uh, usually you don't don't see uh, the emission in the first. Uh. It's the number of bursts that you have simultaneous with Swift is not very small. Um, it's a small number. Okay. That's a small number of that which are seen by both uh, Swift and uh, LA. Uh, but you're saying you can kind of calibrate that. Okay, that's it. Okay, so there is a paper in preparation on this topic, and um, okay, now I switch on a, a different topic. How is possible to estimate the bulk Lorentz factor from the peak of the afterglow light curve? Okay, so um, this is the usual way um, that people apply to uh, estimate the bulk Lorentz factor from, from afterglow data. Uh, so this argument has been proposed by Riz and Bejaros and Sari and Piran. And they propose that the peak of the bolometric light curve coincides more or less with the start of the deceleration of the fireball. And the deceleration radius is estimated in this way. This is the mass uh, swept up by the blast wave, so the mass from the interstellar medium. And uh, the deceleration starts when this mass is equal to the initial mass of the ejecta divided by gamma, the initial bulk Lorentz factor. So in, in another way, uh, the internal energy of the shocked matter is equal to the initial uh, mass of the ejecta. Okay, so uh, now thanks to this equation, we can link the radius to the observed time, and we derive this equation to estimate the peak time of the afterglow light curve from the um, Lorentz factor. And of course, we have also to assume some value for the density of the interstellar medium and for the kinetic energy of the afterglow. 
um, of the blast wave. Okay. So here there is some example. Um, these are from Molinari et al. 2007. On the top we have uh, optical data and these are X-ray data. So um, as you see yesterday, um, optical and X-ray afterglow in most cases behave very differently. Um, so uh, this is a case where we have a clear peak in the optical and uh, a complicated behavior in the X-rays. So um, by measure the peak time of this light curve, Molinari et al. estimated this uh, bulk Lorentz factor. Uh, unfortunately, they don't use the equation proposed by Sari Piran, um, but they just, uh, I don't know why, <laughs> but they put a factor of two um, in this equation, so I guess that they are overestimating the bulk Lorentz factor. And unfortunately, all the other authors that use uh, this method to estimate the bulk Lorentz factor uh, use the equation by Molinari. We, then I think that bulk Lorentz factor that you find in literature can be overestimated. Okay, so. You're saying there's a simple factor of two between Molinari and Solomon Yes. Yes, because Molinari say that they, um, with the equation, by, they don't say this clearly, but uh, with, with this equation by Sari and Piran, uh, you can estimate the um, Lorentz factor at the deceleration, not the initial one. And then we, uh, they uh, state that at the deceleration, the Lorentz factor um, is half of the initial value. So they multiply by two. Okay, but I, I'm studying um, this topic by using the, the model that I discussed before because we can estimate the, the peak of the light curve and try to understand uh, which is the, the better equation that links the, the, the peak time to the bulk Lorentz factor. Uh, but yes. How fast is the light rising before the peak? So if you look at, for instance, the flux is increasing before the peak, in these two cases, what is the behavior? How rapidly is it rising with time? Uh, I don't know. Right. Because you mean that... Um, this is a firm prediction. If this is deacceleration, very simple firm prediction as to how fast the flux should be rising with time before the peak. Yes, but... Um, okay, it's not clear. I mean, in, um, if the interstellar medium is homogeneous, you expect T uh, square. T cubed. And Fine. And if it is different state mutation, different gear. Go ahead. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> um, so how fast is the light that No, be? I don't know in these cases. Is it consistent? Do you think it is consistent with their expectation? Uh, yes. For, for the homogeneous model, yes. It is. Yes. Okay, so in this paper, uh, Girlanda et al. 2012, we collected all gamma ray bursts that show a peak in the optical light curve, like in these cases, and uh, with measured redshift and well known spectral properties. So we collected 27 events uh, that have all these. Uh, that satisfy all these requirements. And uh, we also consider four bursts with GV emission, the, first, the, the, the four bursts with a peak in their light curve. One burst, this one is, is a short. Okay, so we have 27 plus four gamma ray bursts with a peak in the optical or GV light curve. And uh, we can estimate for this burst the uh, uh, Lorentz factor. And this is the result. We consider two different um, models for, for the density profile of the interstellar medium, a homogeneous density and the wind-like density. So uh, density is decreasing and as the radius to the minus two. 
Okay, so this is the distribution. The white bursts represent the bursts um, that have GAV emissions. So in these cases, uh, the, they have the highest value of the Lorentz factor. And uh, we test this correlation between the Lorentz factor that we measure for this sample of burst and the isotropic energy of the prompt emission, the isotropic luminosity, and the peak energy of the prompt spectrum. So, uh, when we consider a homogeneous interstellar medium, we found this broad correlation, and uh, the ISO is proportional to gamma to the 2.2, the same for uh, the luminosity, and here there is the correlation between the peak energy and the Lorentz factor, and we found that uh, um, this correlation is li linear. For the wind case, we found the similar correlation in terms of slope, but uh, the correlation seems to be tighter. Okay, so now that we have the measure of the Lorentz factor for our sample of 31 gamma ray bursts, we can study the co-moving properties of the, spect the um, prompt emission. So, um, in the observer frame, we can measure fluences, fluxes, observed frequencies, observed uh, time scales, but if we know the redshift of the source, we can move to a different uh, reference frame, the so-called rest frame, where we estimate the energetics, luminosities, and the rest frame uh, frequencies and time scale and so on. But this is not the end of the story because there is another reference frame, which is uh, uh, the frame co-moving with the fluid. So all these rest frame quantities are affected by beaming effect. So in, in, in order to move to the co-moving frame, so co-moving means at rest with the fluid, which is um, which has a factor gamma with respect to the, the, the observer, the rest frame. Um, if, if we know the Lorentz factor, we can estimate the co-moving uh, quantities uh, thanks to this relation. Of course, energy should be divided by gamma in order to move from the rest frame to the co-moving frame, and the luminosity should be divided by gamma squared. Okay, so this is a plot for, for the spectral peak energy. These are all gamma ray bursts with measure redshift and peak energy. This is our subsample of 27 plus 4 gamma ray bursts. And this is the rest frame peak energy distribution. If we divide the, the rest frame peak energy by gamma, we obtain the co-moving frame peak energy for the homogeneous or the wind uh, case. So as you can see, there is a clustering of the distribution. And this is the same plot for the isotropic energy. In this case, the um, co-moving distribution is still quite um, broad. And this is, most important, the plot for the isotropic luminosity. In this case, there is a quite strong clustering of the luminosity. So the co-moving luminosity has a typical value, which is more or less uh, uh, two, no, uh, five times 10 to the 48 erg per second. Okay, so um, we can use the results to study, uh, to understand in a deeper way correlation. Uh, first an introduction of this uh, correlation. There is the so-called Amati relation, which is between the rest frame peak energy of the prompt spectrum and the isotropic energetics. And the slope is more or less 0.5. And this is the so-called Yonetoku correlation. On the y-axis, we always have, have the um, rest frame peak energy, but we have, in, in this case, the luminosity, isotropic luminosity, instead of energetics. Also, in this case, the slope is 0.5. There is a third correlation, which is this one. This is the Amati correlation. 
And um, in this case, instead, we plot not the isotropic energy, but the collimation corrected energy. So um, if gamma ray bursts are jetted sources, the true energetics should be estimated by correcting the isotropic energy uh, for the jet opening angle. Okay, so in some cases it's possible to, e to estimate the jet opening angle and to derive the collimation corrected energy. And Gerland et al. 2004 uh, found a tighter correlation between the uh, rest frame peak energy and the collimation corrected energy. So these correlations are important because uh, they are telling us something about the physics of gamma ray bursts. They have been proposed for cosmological purpose to estimate the cosmological parameters. However, there are several problems and issues with this correlation because um, different authors uh, um, propose that this correlation as, are due to instrumental selection effects. So there is a hot debate on this uh, issue, and there is uh, no unified interpretation yet uh, of this correlation. Okay, so um, uh, here we have the Amati and unit Oku correlation um, for these white points. These uh, blue dots instead are the subsample of gamma ray bursts for which we estimate the bulk Lorentz factor. So for this burst, we can plot on this plane the, um, not the rest frame quantities, but the co-moving quantities, which are these red points. So in this case, these red points are the co-moving peak energy and the co-moving uh, isotropic energy. So in this case, for the amatic correlation, we still found a broad relation between these two quantities. Instead, in this plane, uh, there is no correlation, the luminosity um, is very clustered around uh, a typical value, and this is um, particularly interesting. Uh, these are for the homogeneous interstellar medium, instead, in this case, we assume a wind interstellar medium. So maybe in, the, in this case, for a wind interstellar medium, the clustering of the luminosity is even um, stronger. And this plane is particularly interesting because we now can explain the Yonetaku correlation, white point, uh, by saying that in the co-moving frame, all gamma ray bursts have almost the same peak energy and the same isotropic luminosity. However, uh, they have different bulk Lorentz factor. So when the bulk Lorentz factor is small, a, a gamma ray burst move from here to here. When a Lorentz factor is high, a gamma ray burst from, move from here to there. So when we move from the co-moving frame to the rest frame, we produce a correlation, which is just a sequence of bulk Lorentz factor. Okay. Uh, just to summarize, so we found that the peak energy, rest frame peak energy, which is equal to the uh, co-moving frame peak energy um, times gamma zero, is proportional to gamma zero, and this is the relation, of course, with a given dispersion. Instead, the isotropic energy is proportional to gamma square, and uh, also the luminosity is proportional to gamma square. So, by putting together this equation, we can explain both the Amati and the Yonetoku relation, and we can derive the, excess, the, the slope which is seen in the data. Okay, the, the last uh, step. Why is the original source spread so large you know, when you go with your red cluster? Sorry? If, if you go back to where you have a red cluster of points, Right. Sorry? So why is that so much spread? I mean, I understand why you spread out along that way, but why is the original? This is measured data as opposed to your model? Yes, no. Uh, in my opinion, the question is why is so clustered? 
you don't expect that all gamma ray bursts have the same properties in the commoving frame. So this is a, a quite strange result. But we found that if you estimate the commoving properties, it seems that all bursts are similar in, in the frame at rest with the, yeah, the it's, fluid. It's like the type 1 AC members, you expect them to be the same if the underlying physics is the same. But then in fact, the question is, is it, can it be tightened up? Is there an extra factor that you can put in there that tightens that, that cluster up? Because right? mm. then it gives you a standard camp. Otherwise, it doesn't. Uh, yes, but uh, the strange is that this happens in, in, in the commoving frame, which is a but you derive those by taking the, yeah. the points there and the fitting them, right? Yes. But if there is no correlation between these quantities and, and the Lorentz factor, we do expect to have a broader distribution of these red points also in the commoving frame. Instead, we found that these points have small Lorentz factor and these points have a larger Lorentz factor and this produces this clustering in, in right. the commoving. That, that's telling you about the underlying physics mechanism. So, but you produce this red cluster by backing the data. From yeah. That, right. So the question is, were there additional correlation, different additional features, either systematic or cross correlations, or extra features? So, like the supernova, type one A supernova, you make the luminosity tighter by including. Make her, yeah. Factors, right? So that's. A, that you believe is a modification of the physical factor. Mm -hmm. Here, is it actually just a correlation in the estimating of gamma, or is, it a, or is there some other feature that, it, that explains the residual scatter? Uh, this, uh, I don't know. I think that now the question is to understand uh, this uh, behavior in the commuting frame. So now the, the, the interest move from the correlation to this clustering uh, in, into the, the commoving frame to understand uh, uh, if they actually have all these typical values in, in, in their commoving. Uh, okay. I, I, would, yes. I would go further with this and ask, if you've discovered that the physics in the commoving frame is always the same, yeah. always the same in high structure then what, then what makes for Spread, so that's, that spread is about sort of order of magnitude. What is yes. for uh, about maybe even more than order of magnitude in the peak energy? Yes, it's one order of magnitude. But we don't know if it's dominated by errors or, I mean, there are a lot of assumptions right. in all the this. The scale is missing here. But that, that peak is, is uh, what is the actual energy, the typical peak energy? Uh, sorry, is uh, um, so this is 10 keV. So the typical value is uh, 6 keV. Yeah, there are mechanisms that will give you an investment of peak energy. Yes. But and then it's a question of how much the, the, the yeah. jet boosts in order to give you this thing. Yes. So the physical mechanisms. Which is somewhere, which is somewhere in the MEV cap range, and that gives you the synchrotron and the KV range. So it's not surprising that the energy it should be tight in energy. It's surprising that the luminosity should be the same. Luminosity is surprising. Heat is also surprising because, as you say, it depends on the magnetic field that is generated, right. and it depends on the injection energy of the Will need to be much larger than NEV to 
to produce a synchrotron photon of energy of K six yeah k photon. Right. See, because that requires more like something on the order of it, uh, G the energy for the electron in the quantum wave. Yeah. In the quantum wave. Yes. What, what field are you taking? Of course, of course. Right. So yeah. that depends on the field, and the field that I chose was something on the order of ten to hundred cars. Ten, right? Whereas I'm assuming it's much higher. Much higher. You could, you could. But that, of course, you go into immediately a different regime. May I suggest the following? Because Lana is looking at Paris and right. wondering, wondering that the focus should be on Paris. And I want to take a particular. No, 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 please. Here she's finding the cluster. <laughs> and the question that I have is why is the No, no, no. These why are, is the cluster these so are, broad? No, there, there, there's a great question, and the discussion is great. And as I've been asked to do this, this little responsibility, so I just want to make sure yeah, to let, let you should have asked me to do it because yeah. you know, I'm <laughs> there can be another discussion. No, no, the, the, we are going into the discussion. So right. what my suggestion is, just just let's do this. Uh, let her complete this okay. because she has got only a few minutes left right. to complete things. And then we are going into the discussion. And the good news is that after this thing is not just five minute discussion, the next thing is also basically an hour long discussion. So some of that time can be used to continue discussing these things and then we'll go on to Compton telescopes, for instance. So I'm going to sit down, you complete your part. Okay. <laughs> uh, so the, the last step is to understand if it is possible to explain also the Girlanda correlation. In this case it's more difficult because we don't know the jet opening angle, but we can try a different exercise. So what we need in order to understand, uh, to explain the Girlanda correlation. So, um, this is the Amati correlation and to go from the isotropic energy to the, um, maybe there is a question. Okay, yeah, here, so to estimate the collimation corrected energy, we have to multiply the isotropic energy for theta square, so this means that the two correlations are not parallel. So this means that here we have very large jet opening angle, and here we have very small jet opening angle. But we just say that here we have very small Lorentz factor, and here we have huge Lorentz factor. So this means that there is an anti-correlation between the jet opening angle and the bulk Lorentz factor. So let's assume that this is the relation between these two quantities. So the theta jet gamma zero is a constant. So in this case, uh, we can estimate uh, the collimation corrected energy and it's proportional to gamma zero because theta square is proportional to uh, one over gamma zero we saw that the isotropic energy is proportional to gamma zero, so, um, uh, sorry, to gamma square. So this uh, quantity is proportional to gamma, which is proportional to the peak energy. So under this assumption that we introduced ad hoc, uh, we derived the Girlanda correlation, um, collimation corrected energy proportional to the peak energy, so linear correlation. Um, okay, I reported here this equation, and now we can estimate the co-moving collimation corrected energy. So this is the uh, rest frame collimation corrected energy divided by gamma, and so this term is proportional to gamma over gamma is a constant. Uh, this equation. Is it normal as well as gamma to the first? Uh, this is an assumption. Yeah. Yes. This is just being assumed. Okay. And you're, okay. again, okay, point that you're saying, yeah, it would be more natural to expect that it may be roughly one over gamma yeah. uh, or some multiple of that. Right. But the square root is not exactly a very natural scale. Okay. Yes, we assume this just to uh, derive the, the Girlanda correlation. There is no physical meaning for this uh, relation. 
Okay, so in this case, we found that the collimation corrected energy in the co moving frame is almost the same for all gamma ray bursts. And we previously found that also the co moving peak energy is almost the same for all gamma ray bursts. This means that all GRB is emit the same amount of energy at the same uh, typical frequency irrespective of the Lorentz factor. So in this plane, uh, these are rest frame quantities, but when we um, put the um, co-moving properties of gamma reverse, all gamma reverse start from here. Then um, when we move to the uh, rest frame, um, again, the, here we have uh, energy in both cases, so we should multiply by gamma and we found a linear correlation, which is the Girlanda correlation. Um, uh, we propose that is a sequence of a Lorentz factor. This is just the conclusion. So we study the commoving properties of 31 gamma ray bursts, and for this sample, we estimate the bulk Lorentz factor, considering both homogeneous and wind line density profile. We found these three correlation between the bulk Lorentz factor and the isotropic energy, lum isotropic luminosity and peak energy of the spectrum. By considering these two equations, we can derive the Amati relation. And by considering these two relations, we can explain the Yonitoku correlation. Okay, now if we consider these two, and we add this assumption, we are also able to explain the linear Girlanda correlation. Okay, finally we found that in the co-moving frame, uh, gamma ray bursts as these typical quantities. Um, uh, this is particularly true for the isotropic luminosity, which has for all gamma ray bursts this typical values of 5 times 10 to the 48. Thank you.